Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Health Promotion, Celebrating Our Roots and Looking to the Future. My name is Monica Nunes. I'm a Knowledge Exchange Specialist at Public Health Ontario, and I have the pleasure of moderating today's session. Today, I'm joining from 661 University Avenue into Toronto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. I also appreciate and acknowledge the many First Nations, Inuit and Métis people who are caretakers and live on this land now. Most days, though, I work not far from the Humber River, which is part of the Toronto Purchase, Treaty 13, the Toronto Carrying Place Trail, a route that ran parallel to the river, was a major portage route in Ontario and was used by First Nations peoples for thousands of years to travel, fish, hunt and trade between Georgian Bay or Lake Simcoe and Lake Ontario. As part of colonization, European settlers eventually used this route for their own settlement and gain. In the context of today's webinar focus, looking to the future of health promotion, I mention this as it has implications today on health promotion, on the right of Indigenous individuals to the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. So I acknowledge my responsibility to facilitate this right and the public health and health promotion work that I do. And personally, I'm gonna be reflecting on this in the frame of today's discussion. Before we begin the discussion, I will mention a few housekeeping items. The chat pod has been disabled to limit any distractions during the presentation. So please use the Q&A pod if you have questions during the session. A question period will follow our panel presentation. If at any point during this session, you experience any technical issues, please email my colleagues at capacitybuilding at oahpp.ca. Also, we'll be using a website called Mentimeter today. We'll post links in the chat to two Mentimeter boards, which you can use to contribute to the conversation. Our first board, which I'll ask to have pulled up right now, asks you, what health promotion means to you. Now we're gonna be asking this question of our panelists too. So we'd love to hear from you and hear your perspective now on what health promotion means to you. And I know we're gonna sh shortly share your responses on the screen so you can have a look at what others are thinking in terms of what health promotion means to them. So here we go. Let's take a look at some of our responses here. Okay, great. I'm seeing some very specific actions and strategies, um, raising awareness, education, making things upstream, capacity building, also seeing important value-oriented approaches and broad concepts, changing the environments we live in so we can thrive through policy. Great. Thanks, everyone. I'm curious to hear what our panelists will say as well. I think there is definitely going to be some alignment there. Now, to get us into our discussion, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Andrea Bodkin. Andrea is a Senior Program Specialist in Health Promotion here at Public Health Ontario and has worked in public health and health promotion since 2003. Andrea brings her enthusiasm and expertise for planning in all forms, evaluation, community engagement, partnership development, and facilitation to public health units across Ontario. Andrea holds a master's degree in public health with a specialty in health promotion from Deakin University in Melbourne, Australia. She, along with numerous colleagues and partners, develop the new Health Promotion Essentials course. With that, I pass it over to you, Andrea, to please tell us more about the new course and introduce our amazing panelists for today. Thank you so much, Monica, for that introduction. It's great to hear uh, about where you live, learn, work, and play um, beside the um, uh, Humber River, because I am beside Wiscotinach, which is now known as the Don Valley and Don River, which was also an important route uh, and part of culture for many First Nations. So today we're here as part of the pre-launch celebrations for our brand new health promotion course called Health Promotion Essentials. 
And it's a six module course that's designed to give learners an introduction to health promotion, what it is, why it's so important, the theories and the concepts that define it. And we designed the course both for health promoters and also for all of the people who work alongside of health promoters, maybe managers and directors and decision makers at your organization, community partners, other folks that you do work with that might benefit from knowing why what we do is so important. We're going to be launching the course in mid-May, um, and the course will be available on PHO's website. And as Monica mentioned, there were a lot of people involved in developing the course, many folks at PHO, many external partners, including our three wonderful panelists today, um, who I'm going to tell you a little bit more about in a second. So really we're here today because I thought that going through a new online course on webinar format would be quite dull. So what we're going to do is have a conversation with three incredible thought leaders in health promotion, really just to talk about what health promotion is, what it means to us, and where we think it might be going in the future. So our three panelists for today, and I've listed us all in alphabetical order, uh, Jessica Lefebvre is a health promotion specialist at the Eastern Ontario Health Unit. And Jessica was also on the advisory committee for the course. So it's really terrific to have her involved in today's session. And part of the course also involves hearing from health promoters about what a day in their life is like. And Jessica contributed one of those. Sume Ndembo Ayo is the executive director for the Black Health Education Collaborative and an assistant professor at uh, uh, University of Toronto's Dalai Lana School of Public Health. And Sume contributed a wonderful video on anti-racist health promotion that features in our course. And we also have Susan Stewart, who is the director of the Community Health and Wellbeing Portfolio at Kingston, Frontenac and Lennox, Lennox and Addington Public Health. And Susan is the chair of both Health Promotion Ontario, who contributed quite a bit to our course and uh, to promoting today's webinar. And she is also chair of the Ontario Chronic Disease Prevention Managers in Public Health Network. And she sits on the board of directors for the Associ Association of Local Public Health Agencies and the Ontario Physical and Health Education Association. And Susan also recorded a terrific video uh, for the course and her health unit contributed one of our case studies. Welcome and thank you so much everybody for being here. So let's start off. We asked the folks who have joined us here today, but let's hear from our wonderful panelists about what health promotion means to you. It's one of those things that's a little bit difficult to define in a 30 second elevator pitch. Most of my family thinks that I still work in a hospital, but I'm really curious about what you feel like health promotion is to you. Let's start with Sume. Uh, thank you, Andrea. Pleasure to be here today. As I start, I just want to acknowledge that I, in my role with the Black Health Education Collaborative, I do my work with partners across Turtle Island, but spend most of my time on the traditional lands of various Indigenous peoples, including some which uh, Andrea and Monica have shared, but also on the lands of the Kanyigahaga, which is some just outside of what is now known as Montreal or uh, Jajayaga. Also, I think as we as we think about um, health promotion and land acknowledgement and how we enter into conversations about equity, social justice, racism, colonialism, it's very important that we acknowledge the land, but also what has happened on the land. And a lot of my work focuses on racism and its impact on health. And what we know is that in the Canadian context, uh, the histories and legacies of enslavement of African peoples and colonization are a core part of how our society as Canada, it's what we know as Canada today, has been defined. So also really acknowledging that history and the Afro-Indigenous peoples across this land who continue to be custodians of these lands. Uh, for me, health promotion is all about values and how those values inform what we actually do. Uh, I came into health promotion really because of a focus of values, of things like equity and social justice, which for me is about envisioning a world where more of us, and ideally all of us, can actually have the resources we need to live good lives, to live healthy lives, to live healthful lives. And so um, it really takes me to 
health promotion as a really deeply ethical practice, right? Which is constantly al um, aligning what we claim we believe in to our values to what we do. Um, a colleague of mine, a former colleague and good friend of mine, Pema Mazumdar and I, when I was with the National Collaborative Center for Determinants of Health, we started thinking through, okay, how do we make this a practical thing? And one of the things we developed was a dialogical tool to support public health organizations to really move from naming values to concretely thinking about, if I care about the equity, what does that mean for me? I'll give you an example, right? Um, the Ottawa Charter talks about love, right? And in, in critical feminist perspectives and critical black perspectives, Radical love is foundational to how you operate in the world. And so we really thought that value of love was an important value for us in public health. And so drawing on work from folks like the great Martin Luther King and uh, Bell Hooks is one of my faves, right? Who talks about love as both an intention and an action. And so if we see love as an intention and an action, then we think about at a, at a public health or health promotion level, we can elevate that to our to our communities and think about how we design communities which are socially connected, in which everyone is cared for in those communities. So for me, health promotion is ultimately about taking those values which are very, they're relatively easy to state, right? But then doing the hard work of transforming that into what we do in a very practical sense. I love that. Thank you, Sume. Uh, Susan, what do you think health promotion is? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I am uh, situated in Kingston on the beautiful shores of Lake Ontario, which are the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and the Huron-Wendat. Um, so health promotion for me to, um, to build on Sumay's very elegant uh, answer, it's, a, it's really about creating those conditions that we need for health, for optimal health. And when I say conditions, I'm not just referring to the physical conditions which we live in, but also the social constructs uh, helping to create those conditions. And when we talk about creating these conditions, I think for, for health promotion, it really means that we have to work across sectors. Because if we're talking about meaningful change, often those levers for change sit outside of the scope or jurisdiction of public health units, community health centers, nonprofits, where, or other organizations where health promoters work. So if we really want to talk about change, we have to engage other people in that conversation and in that change. So we really need to work across sectors. So for me, health promotion, the, the partnerships and the collaboration is really a cornerstone of the work that we do because we can't do it alone. So that's what I really see as health promotion. It's having those collaborations, those, those partnerships that allow you to have that all of society approach to make the changes that we need so that people can, can experience optimal health. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And Jessica, what about you? Yeah, um, hi. Uh, I couldn't agree more with you, Susan. Um, I'm coming from the traditional lands of the uh, Haudenosaunee, um, just outside of uh, Cornwall, Ontario. Um, yeah, and especially like in the smaller um, rural communities or smaller organizations where, you know, we have very, very few health promoters on staff. We really rely on these um on leveraging those partnerships internally and externally. Um, for, for me, the health promotion is, um, is an opportunity to, to be curious and seeing why things are happening, um, digging deeper and, and finding out, you know, just kind of seeing why things are happening again. And, um, and even if health promotion is, is, it's just one part of public health, um, the impacts are cross-cutting. So we can work in different domains, different sectors, um, different settings and across the lifespan. And that's really what attracted me to health promotion. So um, really that the diversity of, of work was, was what interested me. It's so interesting to hear your answers because, you know, the definition that we use in the course is, is a, a vision or normative ideal of, of health promotion working to address the social conditions in which people live, learn, work, and play. And I certainly heard that from the three of you. Uh, and we talk a lot about partnerships and health promotion because otherwise we couldn't get anything done. But I think today's the first time that I heard words like love and curiosity to define health promotion. And I, I just think that's fantastic. We've seen a lot of changes in health promotion. Um, Monica mentioned I've been in the field for just over 20 years. Um, I think we've all been practicing for quite some time. And if I think back to the very beginning of my career, 
We did a lot of brochures and I was at a lot of health fairs. We were really focusing on giving people information, hoping that that would be enough to um, help them to live healthy lives. How have you seen things change, Susan, in your time in, in health promotion? Well, thanks, Andrea. I've seen a, a lot of change happen in, uh, in health promotion, probably being uh, long in the tooth at this point in my career. You know, when I started in public health, um, in health promotion, the, the Ottawa charter was, was somewhat new. Um, and it hadn't really yet been fully adopted and implemented. So there was still a lot of what I would call health education, which really came out of the, the Lalonde report. And I, and I know that the Lalonde report is in 1970s. It's really dated. People still know it today. Although it, it, it was, uh, a water a watershed document in terms of really changing that health is inevitable to something you can do about it. And a lot of health ed education came from that report. Um, and then the Ottawa Charter came that said, you know, it's not just about personal skills. There are other pieces that we need. We need policy, we need supportive environments, we need uh, community action, and we also need uh, reorienting the health services. And so I think from there, we really saw public health broaden into other areas. I mean, I think it took a while for it to broaden, but I think it really did. And people talk about these upstream approaches and looking at policy more so than, um, you know, health education initiatives and being able to really, um, be more effective and less resource intense that the health education type of approach has always taken. And then from there, you know, um, so that was kind of earlier in my career where policy and we we're all looking at policy and policy analysis. Um, and then I saw a change where the social determinants of health became part of the, the conversation about health promotion and, and those conditions in which people live, work and play. And I would say from my experience, a lot of that social determinants of health was really focused on poverty. So when people talked about the social determinants of health, a lot of that was really on poverty. Let me just back up a moment. Actually, before I saw the social determinants of health, what I really saw was the built environment and the, the, the physical environment in which we live, right? So we went from health education to the, the broader one, but then it really became focused on that physical place in which we live, like community design, um, you know, organizational policies to make, you know, the healthy choice, the easy choice. And so there was a lot of that on the physical uh, setting in which we lived. And then I saw the social determinants of health come in with that real focus on policy, uh, poverty initially, initially. And I would say in the last couple of years, particularly since COVID, I think the conversations about those social determinants of health have really broadened in a more meaningful way and I'm not suggesting that there isn't more work to be done but conversations on colonialism racism sexism heterosexism and all of these social constructs and that's part of the evolution that I've seen in health promotion and now I, I almost see it kind of also embarking on issues of sustainability which I don't think health promotion had really focused on before so I think, you know, I, I've seen a lot of change in health promotion from, from when I really started to, to where we are now. And when I look at that, I think we should be pretty proud of how we've been able to broaden what we do. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Jessica, what have you seen? Uh, I haven't been around as long, uh, <laughs> but I definitely saw that shift to like moving from um, addressing behaviors and even if they, they still have a place in health promotion, um, but it, there's a lot less focus. And I, I think part of that focus on like behaviors and individual change and those individual messaging had to do like it's an easy um, easy number. It's easy to capture. It's easy data to like show, look, we've done you know, distributed this many pamphlets or we've gone to this many fairs or, you know, so it was an easy way to show what we do. Whereas as you move, you know, towards addressing uh, physical environments or even cultural environments and then moving on to, you know, equity and stuff, it, it becomes a little more difficult to to describe. Um, and so um, even for eating behaviors, we would, you know, we were doing a lot of food skills courses and individual messaging and pamphlets, but without the extra to kind of support the the behavior. So now we're starting to see that um, a little bit more um, and, and considering 
you know, and be more intentional and explicit about um, addressing um, like equity and and uh, those environment pieces along with the um, individual messaging. So yeah, it's really a, a whole whole approach kind of thing. So two very optimistic views of how health promotion has evolved over the last little while. What about in your experience, Sumei? <laughs> Thank you, Andrea. Um, I've been doing a lot of health promotion reflection in in different spaces. Susan mentioned the Lalonde report, and just um, I think next week in in Montreal there is a conference talking about Lalonde at fifty and what has happened and where we need to go. And in all the spaces, and even in my I'd say over the last um, fifteen plus years, what strikes me is that I think in health promotion we do and not in public health generally actually we do a better job at at saying the right things, right? In terms of equity and the social terms of health, then we actually do invest in shifting those conditions of everyday life, which we all, I think at this point in, in health promotion, there's a good recognition that where we live, work and play affects our health, right? Um, we focus on different determinants of health to varied degrees, um, as Susan was sharing earlier. But I think that really active focus on actually changing those remains a big gap. So um, what some folks will call the no-do gap, and it's not just a Canadian problem. We see this really across um, across the world. So we're at a point where uh, we continue to research about health equity, about the, be the better health promotion approaches. We continue to develop the plans, the strategies, but in terms of what we actually do in health promotion, there remains a, a gap. Like every single time you ask what well, the balance is from, say, the personal skill to the policy, it's so heavily weighted towards um, personal skills, which, by the way, are critically important. Um, or even things like supporting supporting people to make you know good, healthy choices. A colleague of mine who works on on issues like the safe dr drug supply, she shared recently that at um, if you go to music festivals, which tend to be attended by affluent white kids. You usually find drug testing there, right? So ensuring that those kids have a safe drug supply. That that put that and that's a very tangible help um help promotion uh response. That kind of response is not available to everyone who uses substances in different ways, right? So we still have, even at that level, we still have quite a bit of inequity in terms of how help promotion uh is responding. I certainly did see that shift. I have seen that shift from a deep focus on uh poverty reduction. And that look you um in the past, I think that used to look like um health promoters participated in things like poverty reduction networks as one way to develop those partnerships. I think that work remains critically important. Right? We're at a point where again life is becoming more more affordable by the minute for more and more people. So we need to continue that work. Um, and at the same time, I think bring a more more nuance to that. We can be doing poverty reduction work, which doesn't actively take into account that the ways in which things like ability impact your experience of poverty or the ways in which racism and colonialism um, play into that. So even in the things which we have been doing for a long time, there's an opportunity for us to, to deepen that work. In terms of our focus on uh, racism, I was at the Canadian Public Health Conference a few weeks ago, and there was a panel on racism and health. So it's 2014, the first time CPHA had that conversation was 2016 or 15, one of those, which I moderated. And it was shocking to me that it was the first time. Eight years later, honestly, the conversation hasn't shifted quite, um, it hasn't shifted a lot. When you ask public health units who's actually doing work on racism, like not actual work, very few public health units in this country can say we are doing focused work. You may have a plan, you may have a strategy, but at the implementation, a lot of folks are still getting stuck. So when I think about sort of our trajectory as health promotion, a lot has happened. There's a lot of gains in terms of our discourse, but still a long way for us to go in terms of what we actually um, do. And so I always think about like, what, what do our communities look, feel like? if we actually do the things we say we want to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking back to the Ottawa Charter, which was released in 1986. And as you mentioned, Sume, the Lalonde at 50 uh, conference happening next week in Montreal. So uh, the Lalonde report came out um, 50 years ago. And Susan, you mentioned this, we haven't fully implemented 
the Ottawa Charter. Even even today, you know, it it set out you know th five action areas and three sort of different types of disciplines. We want to enable and mediate and advocate. But in, in doing all of the research for the course, even though I've been in health promotion for a really long time, I still learned a lot of different things. And there is a lot of research out there telling us that um, health promotion in many ways just hasn't been implemented the way it was designed. You know, we default to health behaviorism, um, where we're just telling people what to do. We recognize where um, people's challenges and poor health is coming from, but we have a tendency to, to kind of do this lifestyle drift thing where we just sort of continually drift back towards lifestyle challenges. Those are some of the things that I see. What are other challenges that you see for health promotion? Uh, let's start with Jessica on this one. Um, I, I think part of it is really like the social and political climate. Um, that, that it really impacts our work. So like we mentioned, health promotion relies a lot on partnerships, internal, external, uh, cross-sectoral. So, you know, we, we rely sometimes on individuals and groups that might not have the same uh, set of values as us, as health promoters, which which can really pose a barrier. So I find, I'm finding myself, I'm promoting health promotion <laughs> most <laughs> as a first step uh, to, to kind of like, let's, let's find a, be on the same level kind of thing um but i think it's important too to um to kind of meet them where they are as well so meet those partners so, so we can progress but th that can take a lot of time which is a challenge um but it's not impossible so that's um and, and like uh sumi and, and susan mentioned like a lot of the shifts in social environment can't happen with these well these partners so you know we kind of have to go sometimes we need to shake it up a bit, but it's uh, it's important to kind of you know, meet them where they are and then go from there. Um, and sometimes I find it's it's difficult to relay the actions back to health promotion. So a lot of, the, because we're working in partnerships, we work in the background often, it's a lot of people don't, don't relay, for example, um, uh, Susan's example, which she'll talk about later, but you know, we don't think of that as health promotion uh, right away. So it's, uh, you know, it's less concrete, I guess. It's harder to to relay. Yeah, it abs it absolutely can be. You're making me think, Jessica, about during the pandemic when people referred to public health as you know public health is working well when we're not talking about it. And there's something that could be said similar to health promotion, where it's not necessarily that we're all out there doing health promotion. Sometimes we're infusing the work of our organizations with the health promotion values and principles and frameworks. What What do you think, Susan? Challenges. So, yeah, so a lot of um kind of things come to mind. I think by and large, one of the the most significant challenge to me in health promotion is a lack of investment in prevention. And so I think health promotion by and large tends to be under-resourced because of that. And the dollars go a lot to the healthcare system to address those immediate needs. Um, so I think that's one of the, one of the challenges. Um, and it's kind of building a little bit on what Jessica's already shared about that lack of understanding of what health promotion really is and and your introduction andrea about the, the the still that drift into lifestyle and what gets what gets measured gets done and when you work in public health and i i, I can't speak to other sectors we have these accountability standards and they like to count things and it's very difficult to count health promotion and so then you don't see the benefits of health promotion and so it's it's almost like a negative feedback loop um where it's kind of like well if you don't understand what health promotion is and then you can't count it why are we going to invest in it so there's a lack of really good evaluation for health promotion that happens because it's more complicated to do and the evaluations tend to be more you know expensive and I will say there's also a lack of investment in evaluation often. People just want to implement, implement, implement. And uh, we, need, we really need to evaluate and demonstrate, um, you know, the worth of health promotion, because I think when it's done and it's done right, it can make uh, significant inroads into some of the issues that we're facing. And then building on that, I think another challenge is this complexity that we're seeing. You, you know, it's it, 
it isn't just, I don't want to say just, it isn't about promoting behaviors anymore, like healthy eating, physical activity, even those, those behaviors are very complex. And I understand that. But now there's things like, you know, the drug poisoning crisis, homelessness, racism. And, and so working on these really complex issues, it makes it really difficult because it's, it's difficult work and it can be slow work. And so again, it becomes very difficult to, to measure how health promotion has, has helped in these issues. And I do believe that having people who are trained and invested in health promotion and understand the principles of health promotion are very helpful. Um, but I do think it's, it's really um, difficult to measure. So I think that's a, that's a theme. And then finally, another theme, I think social media is really, it can be a help and it can be a hindrance. But a lot of social media, you know, has confirmatory bias built into it, right? So when you search something and you click on things, the search engine's like, oh, that's what you're interested in. So now when you search that, I'll send you more of what you're interested in and not an unbiased view of issues. And so I think that can make it really more difficult. We saw that play out in COVID for sure. You know, if, if you were concerned about vaccines or you thought vaccines were unsafe and that's what you click on, the next time you search it, more of that comes into your feed. So I think that's another challenge in health promotion is this information overload, but this quick accessibility to non-validated information. And that makes it challenging too. So I think I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks, Susan. What about you, Sumi? What are some of the challenges that you see? Well, um, I think absolutely, Andrew, some of the challenges which you noted at the beginning, I think the lifestyle drift um, remains a challenge. And there's a way in which we are complicit in that lifestyle drift. Um, some folks have called this like this idea of a fantasy paradigm, which is that we we know that the lifestyle issues are not going to solve the health problems and health challenges we're seeing in our communities. But then at some point, we start to speak about them as though they will. And I think that's a, those are ways in which we in health promotion are complicit in that problem. The lifestyle drift's not just happening in a vacuum. Like we actively play a role in that in different ways. Um, in terms of our political environment, there is something very concerning, which has been going on for like not the last probably decade or so, but um, in every cycle of progress, you can you can expect a backlash, right, and a retrenchment of any small progressive gains, and we are living that as we speak in the Canadian context. Um, politics is a real thing which we have to engage, and I think um, one of our challenges in health promotion is having the skill to engage in very political conversations in meaningful ways. We are. We are in election season here. It's gonna. It's looking very likely, right? And there will be implications if we if we have a fairly conservative government, which is not just conservative because that itself is not as an issue, but which is also trafficking in some values which are quite anti health promotion values. So where is the health promotion voice in that conversation? We do know that public health units in this province have have provided. Um, to what Susan was saying, provided some clear public health, solid evidence and positions to say, here, if you're thinking about engaging in the elections, we should all, which we should all be doing if you can, here's what you should be asking your, your elected officials, right? So providing support for our communities, like training that action to say, as we go into elections, here are the things which actually matter for health. And our responsibility at the community level is to ensure that we're asking our elected leaders or our potential elected leaders how they are going to respond to the 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 concerns we have. I think one of the challenges around that is we, we've lost the art of like dialogue. We don't talk to each other anymore. We take positions. We 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 stomp our feet in the ground and say, this is my position. I'm not moving from it. So I think health promotion is is navigating that space. And, and in the challenges, I do see some opportunities, right? So one opportunity I think for um, health promotion is creating those spaces and those containers where we can have some really good, deep, meaningful dialogue about the value of health promotion, yes, but also how we as health promotion can support our communities to then make the decisions which matter for us in terms of our health. But ultimately, um, power is about making decisions, right? Making decisions over people's lives, about your own, about others. And our politicians get to do that on a daily basis. So our health promotion needs to um, to address that. So those are some, some thoughts. Mm, thanks. So let's talk a little bit about some examples, because we know that folks who are out there on the line love to have concrete examples of, of what health promotion can look like in practice. 
So I'm going to have each of you share an example or a couple of examples of some of the work that you have seen or been involved in that really gets you excited about health promotion. Uh, Susan, do you want to start? Thanks, Andrea. Sure, I'll start. Uh, so I'll, I'll share a, a project that we did on uh, Radon. And uh, I, I can't see the participants, but if Lisa Monday, who is the manager who uh, led this project, is on the line, all credit goes to Lisa. Um, but radon, for people who don't know, is it's a nat naturally occurring uh, radioactive gas that comes from the breakdown of uh, uranium and rocks, and it can seep into, into buildings, houses and office buildings. And it is the second leading cause of lung cancer after uh, tobacco smoking. It is a, an, what I would call an underappreciated health risk. And so we had had at our health unit for years uh, radon testing kits if people wanted to test and, and no one ever really did uh, because it's an underappreciated health risk. Um, and then we were working with Health Canada and um, we, we didn't really know what our radon levels were in the KFLNA area. So we wanted to get a better sense of what's happening with radon in the homes and buildings in our region. And we... Um, we worked with Health Canada on a, on a methodology and we did a, um, so we did a study, we did an evaluation of what we were doing. And the first thing that we did uh, and thought about was how are we going to get the word out about an underappreciated health risk? Letting people know that we have radon kits really hasn't helped. So how can we, how can we get that message out there? So we used you know, theoretical models. We use the health belief model actually for that one, which is, you know, about perceived risk and perceived uh, efficacy of action. Um, and so, you know, we let people know about the perceived risk and that there's something that you can do about it that's easy and free because we were, the kids were part of what we provided as, as a study. And so we had over a thousand people participate in that study and we had hundreds more who wanted to participate in that study. So I think there's a there's an example of, of using a, a different approach, a health promotion approach in, in terms of how to get that, that message out there. So then we did this uh, test and what we discovered was that 21% of houses in, um, I say KFLNA, so that's Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Huntington. So the KFLNA area, 21% were above Health Canada's um, radon guidelines, which is 200 becquerels per meter cubed. When you look at the World Health Organization, which actually has a lower threshold, which is 100 uh, becquerels per meter squared or meter cubed, 51% of houses exceeded that. In our study, we also looked at what are some of the factors that people consider um, if they're going to mitigate. And we used the, I'm going to read this because then I'm going to say it wrong, the precaution adoption process model for that and started looking at what are some of the factors that people are going to consider if if they're going to test and so that was very informative um for us at the at the end of the day we uh, worked with the city and we worked with health canada um the city being the city of kingston so in the city of kingston is it just the city of kingston sorry i've got notes here lisa knows it better than i do okay all municipalities, actually, not just the city of Kingston, but all municipalities within KFLNA changed their local building code to have soil and gas control measures included in new houses and additions built after August 2019. So there is a significant policy change there um, so that homeowners, it would be less expensive for them if they detected radon in their home, the mitigation is already built in. It, it's an easy thing to do. So that's a when you think about it, a significant policy change. The other outcome of, of that study was this, that engagement with our municipal partners and the city of Kingston, you know, talking about them, you own or run or manage a lot of social housing. What's happening with radon there? This is what we're finding in homes. What's happening to these ind individuals who are living in this these buildings, so very much an equity approach. And so we worked with the city to start testing um, the social housing units in the city of Kingston. I could actually listen to you talk about this initiative all day because it's not its not what you would think of as a health promotion program. You used health promotion approaches. Uh, you worked in partnership. Uh, you went beyond raising awareness. Um, you helped people determine what to do. You had policy changes. I mean, all of the things that we think about when we think about a health promotion or approach are all kind of wrapped up in that terrific um, initiative around, as you were calling it, an unappreciated 
or an underestimated health hazard. Um, so I, I love I love that approach. Um, Sume, do you have an example for us? Yeah, so I'm going to share three examples which do all slightly different things. Uh, so we've been talking a lot about the importance of really shifting the everyday conditions within which communities live, within which we all live. And I think one of the things which we really need is some deep investment in communities. Uh, there is the Purpose Build Communities. It's an initiative out of the U.S. And uh, I know in the, in the Q&A, there's a question about industry, right? Um, the Ottawa Charter does talk about um, the help promotion role and sort of mediating some of the conflicts which arise between different industries. And I personally struggle with, you know, industry because I tend to think of it as harmful, but then industry can be used for good. And the Purpose Build Communities is one example of that, where it's really public-private partnerships, where they have invested deeply in disenfranchised communities, which tend to like low-income communities with a high proportion of um, black and other black and brown folks in the US. And that investment has led to like significant improvements in the communities, everything from education to the quality of housing to reductions in crime. It's all things which we know are good for our health and our well-being. So I think we can think about um, these sort of um, really large scale community redevelopment efforts as something which we should be bringing, which really aligns with health promotion. Um, a more immediate example, which I've been thinking about lately is um, as we think about the ways in which police violence continues to harm black and brown people in this country, one of the challenges we know is that police get called to situations where someone is actually a mental health crisis and police are not trained to deal with people in with mental, they're not mental health professionals. Um, in Toronto right now, there is the Toronto Crisis Response Unit, which then goes to mobile unit, which then has trained mental health professionals who get called instead of the police. And what that means is that in real time, the chance that someone gets shot or brutally assaulted by the police is reduced. So that's like a very immediate thing where you can see the impact immediately. And again, that that um, this program is really because of a lot of community organizing and actives in the city of Toronto. The last one I'll mention is uh, it's work I'm doing with the Black Health Education Collaborative. And um, a lot of the work which we're doing is really thinking about how what we learn as health professionals be it in health promotion, in public health, in medicine, across disciplines, like how that informs how we practice in the field. Most of us do not learn anything meaningful about Black folks, about Black health, about Black well-being, about anti-Black racism. Uh, some colleagues at the Black Public Health Collective, their study found it was some like four out of a hundred, over a thousand courses at the master's level in public health actually have anything meaningful on anti-Black racism four out of over 1,000. So our work is really trying to transform our educational system so that we, as health professionals coming through those systems, are learning accurate information, um, developing the right skills, so that when we go to, into our practice, be it a research practice or practice in the health unit or in community, we actually are better equipped to, uh, to meet the challenges which we face. So another three examples that we might not think of as health promotion programs, but hopefully what folks who are who have joined us in the webinar today are hearing is maybe there really is no such thing as a, a health promotion program. Maybe it's applying a health promotion framework or lens like Susan's example. Maybe it's just really looking at how do we act with community and with partners based on our health promotion values and make change. Jessica, do you have an example for us? Yeah, um, I have an example. It's maybe at the smaller scale, um, at a local scale, but we've, uh, and I worked on this project or this strategy or intervention. I, guess, I think with health promotion, it's it's really um, concentrated or focusing on different strategies and interventions, and, and that becomes the approach, right, uh, versus just a program. I think when we think of program, it's more, you know, a start and a finish or a, a you know, a, a workshop or something. So, you know, people tend to default to that. Um, but one that's near and dear to my heart is I, I actually worked on it as an intern um, and then got to see it through um, when I started working in, in public health, but it was a uh, development of a, a menu assessment tool for residential facilities. So really concentrate on, on creating a healthy eating environment. I'm a registered dietitian by trade. So this one is, you know, going back back in the day when I was working as a public health dietitian, but um, 
and it's it was really just to support those residential facilities and the cooks and the administrators to to build healthy menus and healthy eating environments um and, and it involved you know again multiple partners and different approaches and so you know, working with our internal staff or inspectors and public health nurses, but as 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 well as the facilities and the residents, to to, um, to uh, you know implement uh, these menus and promote it, um, and and within that um, that tool, it actually encourages some public health approach or health promotion approaches. So, you know, getting the residents involved and um, meeting them where they are and, and making small changes and not letting. Uh, 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 perfection again the way of progress sort of thing um and so that's one that i'm i'm that's near and dear to my heart but that i i think when i think of health promotion i think of that one i think you raise a really important point jessica because i mean we have so much happening in the world right now and we've all talked about this you know people experiencing homelessness people using substances um the vast amount of skepticism happening all of the challenges that we have going on and sometimes we think that our health promotion work has to be that big. You know, we need to do all uh, action areas in the Ottawa Charter. We need to, you know, go right at the causes of the causes and the causes. And, and we do. And also we can have these concrete, maybe finite programs that are working towards those those bigger picture changes. And I, I want people to understand that all levels of health promotion, um, whether we're doing a health promotion program, whatever that is, or whether we're working with a health promotion lens, that the, the finite concrete pieces are an important part of getting us to the, that, that bigger picture. So we have already a lot of really great questions and very complex questions. So I want to make sure we have a lot of time for those. So let's do um, almost like a little lightning round um, where I'll just ask everyone in, you know, maybe a minute or so to talk about what you get really excited about for the future of health promotion. And I'm gonna take host privilege and go first and say that what I get excited about is this concept of bringing health promotion to other sectors, other fields, um, other types of work, where I think of it like when you have little kids who don't wanna eat vegetables and you hide the spiralized zucchini and amongst the pasta noodles, how can we kind of hide health promotion or infuse health promotion and maybe talk about health promotion into all of the work that, that gets done within the health sector and beyond? So that's one of the things that I get really excited about. Susan, what do you think? What are you excited about? Uh, what I get really excited about is, um, I don't know if people would verbalize it as health promotion, like we need health promotion at the table. But what I find, and, and I will speak to public health um, at this point, and I recognize there's many people who work in health promotion outside of public health, but my experience is that public health is being asked to come to the table about a lot more issues. There's a table that's being formed on racism. Public health needs to be at the table. There's an anti-violence table. Public health needs to be there. Um, so there's a recognition that there is value from health promotion beyond just the traditional chronic disease prevention, you know, substance use kind of realms. And even in substance use, that, that involvement of health promotion in terms of uh, harm reduction and really bringing that uh, to the forefront. So that really excites me. And seeing that climate change, um, where people are looking for that health promotion piece to climate change and not just that health hazard piece. So that, that really excites me about um, where we're going. You were on mute when you said something, Andrea. I was having such a good run. I'm so sorry about that. Sume, what? Hey, I thought that's what you said. Um, you know what? Right now, what excites me is the future of health promotion in terms of what some of the folks who have been trained in health promotion formally, again, recognizing that a lot of a lot of folks work in health promotion without necessarily going through formal health promotion training. But I think um, I'm seeing some really exciting things in terms of what people are learning, the ways in which people are pushing back and really pushing the field forward, right? And just not saying it's not like what we say is not enough, like we need to continue to go deeper and deeper. So I, I'm seeing that from, you know, folks in their early 20s who are, you know, learning about health promotion 
I think I'm thinking particularly at the Masters of Public Health program at Dallas, where I teach, and um, the students in those in that program were just brilliant, right? Like they are, they are, and they will be in the field soon. Some of you may have the pleasure of hosting them for their practicums, and they're asking the right questions. They're asking the tough questions and thinking about what their place in the conversation about health promotion looks like in the future, and what skills they need to bring, and what in what ways would they have to. Uh, really honestly, like push the organizations to go even further than what a lot of organizations are prepared to go. So when I see that, I think, okay, there are changes happening and we we have a lot to be um to be excited and hopeful about. Mm. Thanks, Sume. And Jessica, what about you? What do you get excited about? Well, just to add to what Sume was saying, we, we have nursing students that come through uh, through your nursing students that come through our, our health for practicum and, and we'll do a presentation about what health promotion is and a lot of them are already aware of all of these concepts and the, the theories and the framework but I, I think really it's moving that awareness and to action like that's what excites me is we're seeing a little bit more of that um, there's been a lot of talk um, but and like even if these frameworks and models they're really great bases we, we sometimes get stuck in in that you know, the models and trying to follow them through. And so um, I think trying to to shift a bit and shake up those roots and shake things up a bit, think, do something different. Um, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what the next generation of uh, health promoters um, have have to bring. So um, and I think that this new course, um, health promotion Sessions course is a good is a good base for anyone who's either been working in health promotion for years or as, as a refresher or even as new students just that, as a good base so i'm really excited to to see this uh, this course through thanks jessica i am a little bit excited too <laughs> so that kind of ends our sort of formal panel discussion um, and we're going to go into some questions and answers and i know that monica is going to mention this towards the end of our webinar um, but we do have an evaluation for this session and we've done this session a little differently. We don't often do panel discussions um, in this kind of format. So we'd really love to hear how the session really kind of landed uh, for you. So please do take some time to fill in that evaluation. Wonderful. Thank you, Andrea, Sume, Susan, and Jessica for those incredible insights. We are going to go shortly into our Q&A, and there are already a few wonderful questions for us to attend to. But first, we'd like to hear from you. And we're going to pull, pull up our second Mentimeter board. It's going to transform into a word cloud. And for that, we'd love to know, in one word, what you're taking away from today's conversation. I know that's a tall order <laughs> based on all of the incredible thoughts that we've heard. But um, yes, feel free to, to type away and let us know. Oh, amazing, hope, inspiration, evolution, ubiquity, radical love, equity, excitement. I have to say these were many words that I wasn't anticipating. And it's just, it is that uh, it's very uh, heartening and inspiring political advocacy evolution, critical thinking. Give it a few more seconds because I hear, I think the thoughts are still flowing here. Collaboration, change makers, enthusiasm and accountability. Great. I think we, I think we can pause on our responses now. Oh, there's still a couple more. Let's give it another five seconds or so so that folks can sort of capture what others have posted there. Wonderful, great. Thank you, thank you everyone. And we're gonna continue the, the, um, the discussion now through our Q&A. There have been several questions that have come through. Some are more high level talking about health promotion and its approaches, and then others are sort of looking to our panel for some um, support or guidance around some specific issues and questions that um, participants have. So I'm going to start with a question that's asking us about sort of the, this, this idea of health promotion intersecting within different sectors, um, how we have health promoters that maybe aren't formally trained as health promotion, 
I think this question sort of speaks to that idea. And the question is wondering if the panel has any thoughts on the benefits of having a health promoters team or department in organizations across sectors. So beyond public health units and uh, looking at other sectors outside of that world. So I'll open up to the panel, but maybe maybe Susan, did you want to, to uh, respond to that question first perhaps? I think that it's a brilliant idea. You know, I think that health promotion really and truly is everybody's business. Um, and I think that there are some people who are, you know, have some really great competencies. They, they're trained either formally or informally on health promotion. And I think they do really great work. And I think they should be everywhere. Things are so unsustainable now. I, I it, it's hard to think why there isn't more investment in prevention. But even when you look at our healthcare system, you know it's not going to survive um, if we don't start preventing. You know some of the diseases that are really overwhelming our healthcare system. Our cities, our towns, our communities—they have to be more sustainable. Some of those social determinants of health that are really entrenched and taking away uh, not just from health but from from people's joy. You know, we need to be doing something about that as well. So I say, let's put them in every organization and then let's see some action. <laughs> Wonderful, Susan. Jessica, go ahead. Oh, I'd like to add, I think it's important to have them across the board too. Uh, but I think having that support and, and the uh, like leadership um, to support that as well. We've we've seen organizations that have health promoters on within their, their organizations and they, it, sometimes it, even within the organization, they're not recognized or or their competencies aren't recognized. So it's important to have that leadership and the and the decision makers that are on board with that as well. Um, so that's uh, but yeah, let's let's have health motion everywhere. Thanks, Jessica. Sumi, did you want to uh, get in on that discussion too? I uh, know I would I would agree and um I think we can be even creative about how we get health promoters everywhere. Um a colleague, Dr. Gaynor Watson Cree, talked about I can't remember her specific example, right? But it was her saying, here we are, public health, we'll give you like we have some resources. Here's one of our people. Do what you please and they'll they'll sit with you and hang with you and do some cool things, right? So doing that, not exactly knowing what was going to come out of it, but then just having that contact between someone from public health and another um sector meant that as part as opportunities were emerging, they could identify them like immediately. So I think it's a really cool idea to experiment with. Thanks, everyone. So the the next couple of questions work together and we've touched on it in touched on it in the discussion, but I think it's it's so important that it sort of bears weighing in again. Um, so folks are wondering how to help other public health colleagues understand the scope of public of health promotion work. Um, many still defaults to the health education piece. And then connected to that is, it's hard to recognize the value of health promotion because it's hard to measure. Susan, you spoke to that. Um, and of course, we need more evaluation. We need to um, show the impact of our work. But now, how do we convey this to those who those who whose work is more easily quantified? And the example given was public health inspection. So, how do we do our best right now, today, to show the value of um, health promotion work? And uh, I open it up to our to our panel and Andrea. I'll, I'll go first. There's a, a locally de developed uh, collaborative project that's actually working on um, developing indicators for chronic disease prevention work. Um, I'm a part of one of the work groups there too. And, and the, a lot of the discussion is like, well, we quantifying health promotion is almost near impossible to so that it can really describe the the scope and the, the broad and, and, and like really what we do. And so, you know, I think a quantifiable uh, qual qualitative data is very important too. So really describing what we do and, and, and showing, um, showing the work, I guess, describing it. It's like Andrew said, people like stories. Um, so a lot of storytelling, um, for us internally, we've, we've done campaigns, internal campaigns on, uh, you know, what, what we do in health promotion and presented our staff and here's how we can support you. We do it externally as well with the school boards, you know, here's how we can help in health promotion and, um, really selling health promotion <laughs> internally and externally. So it's, it's, it's part of the work, but, uh, yeah, once they're on board, we we saw it during COVID too. Um, 
where health promotion was, a lot of our work was put on hold because it wasn't considered essential at the time. And now we're seeing the, um, the effects of that. Um, but we were, you know, our health promotion team stepped up and, and we, they were put in different roles, different, different situations and everybody did wonderfully and we got lots of praise for it. So I think there was that recognition at that point where, oh, wow, they, their, their uh, competencies are a lot broader than just, you know, building resources and going to health fairs. Thanks, Jessica. Susan. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I think COVID is a really excellent example of, of, of the tyranny of the urgent, right? Nobody's denying that there didn't have to be an urgent uh, response and that it didn't have to be uh, resourced. And a lot of the health promotion work was, was paused. Um, but in doing so, it was also silenced. Um, people talked a lot about the value of public health, um, but it was always about vaccinations or all these things that you can count. And there is a lot of silence about health promotion, uh, even though health promoters did some really great work in public health units. Um, and so that's what really prompted uh, Health Promotion Ontario's white paper on the value of local um, health promotion. So we wanted to say, you know, here's what health promotion is, and here's when it can look like. It was a report that was really written for uh, the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health and the Ministry of Health. So it's it doesn't describe health promotion as broadly as we've described it today, but it put it in very concrete terms for that um, for that particular audience. In terms of the, the how do you sell health promotion in your organization, and the example with public health inspectors. Um, so I, I like that question because as a senior leader, I, I deal with that, right? Um, when we're talking about resourcing and hiring and, and funding. And so I will say one, first of all, in public health, we're all on the same team. So I don't want to, it's, it's difficult. I don't want to pit health promotion against, um, other sectors like public, uh, public health inspectors or environmental health. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. It's the conversation that you have. Um, because we're under-resourced, we're all there. We've only got so much money. What are we going to do with it? So I can't count health promotion the way that they can count inspectors. They can measure their time and say, if we are going to inspect every single restaurant, according to the Ontario Public Health Standards, it takes this much time. We have this many restaurants. Ergo, I need this many people. And I can't do that. I can't say, oh, I need this many people on alcohol and this many people on, you know, our community drug strategy or whatever we're working on because I can't count that. So I, I don't have those conversations. I talk about need. What is the need in the community? And we need to resource our organization to address those needs. And, you know, how many full-on outbreaks do we have of food poisoning compared to how many people in our community are going to get cancer because they consume alcohol uh, at a level that's above what they should, or how many people are suffering in our community from homelessness, and we need a public health response to that issue. And so I don't go at these conversations toe to toe with counting. I go at it, let's talk about need, let's talk about impact, let's talk about what our community needs, because our job is to meet the needs of the of the community. So it's a slightly different conversation, and I think it's a more productive conversation that I can count and I can't count um, because there's a role for everybody in public health in that conversation because we do need public health inspectors. There are health hazards out there. Um, so I think it leads to a more enriching conversation and a much more collegial conversation when you're when you're having those. The other thing that I do absolutely shamelessly is I take every opportunity to demonstrate what health promotion has done or how we've worked. I will slide it in everywhere. So meeting with medical officer of health, not my current medical officer of health, but one of the medical officers of health. And I'm like, you know what we do every year? Not every year, but every, when it comes around, the official plans for the city, we review them and we make recommendations. And you know what? Every single recommendation that we made, the city has adopted or, or our municipal partner. It's not that we have one major city, but our municipal partners have adopted. We are making, we are having impact on a large scale in our community. So I use those examples that are more concrete, um, but I'm absolutely shameless about promoting health promotion. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Susan. And I love your um, focus on building conversation. I think it speaks to what Sume said earlier about us having lost the art of dialogue and how it's so important for us to come together in a more collaborative, collaborative sense rather than you know trying to um, 
pit our perspectives against one another. Um, Andrea Sume, did you want to speak to that question? You're okay? Okay. We have so many really good questions. So let's many. Go another one. Okay, yeah. let's go. There's there's a couple of questions in here are about um, community partners. So I'll read the one that's um, right here closest. So it says that third sector workers, community nonprofits play a significant role in the community and poverty reduction work. Do you have any experience leveraging those community sectors for health promotion? And if not, can you see value in building those relationships? Um, I can definitely see uh, the value, right? When I think about a lot of the work happening in Black and other racialized communities, that work is that that work happens in the not for profit sector. It happens in organizations led by those groups. A lot of it happens in community health centers who are not necessarily part of our formal uh, public health system. So I do think there is value, especially because. Uh, a lot of the leadership is already happening there. So we in like the formal public health space can learn um, from what's happening. And one of the things which we have, if you're coming from a formal public health sector is credibility. Like you, at the end of the day, like your government, right? Like you're part of the government and that that means something. Um, that is an immense, a, a tremendous amount of power. I'll use that word, yes, power, which you can bring to community work in a positive way. We talk, we think about, we sometimes think about power as a dirty word, but I don't think it is, right? I have power, which I use in particular ways. Um, and I think in, in helping which we can do the same, really just like supporting that work um, and amplifying it and bringing it back to organizations um, uh, in different ways. So yes, I do see the value. Any other thoughts on that question? Um, well, I'll I'll just say I know we have Rob Johannes on the line, who is also involved with Health Promotion Ontario and is a health promoter at Fred Victor Center here in Toronto. Um, and Rob has a video in the course that really speaks, I think, to this question um, about how community groups can really be leveraged because those are the the folks that have those on the ground connections. Um, so I'm not answering the question per se, but I will say that uh, Rob's video in the course does and that there are some examples if you want to uh, reach out to us or reach out to Health Promotion Ontario, read their white paper with lots of examples. I think you'll find some there. Great. So another question that has just come in, I think it's building on some of the some of what you said early on, Sumi, about how it's not enough for a public health unit to have um, strategic plans or um, documents related to anti-racism work for their health units. And this um, attendee is wondering, with an eye towards health promotion, what does it look like for health units to engage in anti-racism work? What are some practical tips and things we can do differently and change in our practice today? Yeah, absolutely. So um, one of the things I say in the video in the course is that I think we do have a lot of the skills in health promotion, which uh, lend themselves very well to anti-racism work. And what I mean by that is, let's say for starters, right, usually what a lot of health units um, start with is, is internal capacity building because most people in the organization do not have the knowledge or skills to engage in anti-racist practice. So that's a core thing. The challenge is not getting stuck there, is learning something and then doing it and not being afraid to to fail because you will, you will, you will. It's part of, we all do, right? When we're learning new things, but the way in which, you know, I grow and we grow is like you, you learn something, you try something out, it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't and you continue to evolve that. And so I think, um, that capacity building is really important. Um, I think about core sort of some core public health things. And uh, one conversation which happened during COVID was, and it, it predates COVID, was sort of the lack of the lack of race based data in across the country, really, or very limited across the country. And in that situation, we saw a failing of our public health leadership in this province. Right, we had our chief med medical officer of health saying. We don't do this because it doesn't really matter, even though our standards say that we have to. So if you're a health promoter trying to use an anti-racism lens, and in that situation, your job is to say, wait a second, we have certain things already which say we should be doing this generally. And so I want to bring this slide because it aligns with a whole bunch of other things which we know we should be doing in public health. Uh, community engagement is another piece. And 
Um, I would say it's community engagement, also a community leadership and community organizer, right? So how do we ensure that um, community voices are front and center, and both community voices within the health unit um, and outside the health unit? How is that really valued and used to inform uh, the work we do? One thing which I find folks really struggle with is this really deep recognition that white supremacy is so found is not so foundation is the foundation on which our nation is built on, right? So how do you accept that as the reality and then move forward, right? And not let that be the place where you get stuck. Um, and I find sometimes in conversations or in, or in planning and implementation that becomes a sticky point because then for white folks you get stuck in. But I'm a good person. I didn't mean to do it. I, you know all those kinds of things. So really doing that active work if you're white folk on the line to learn about that history and unpack that for yourself. And for the black, brown, indigenous folks on the line is thinking about the ways in which our voices can be centered in the anti-racism work in ways in which support our own development and development of our communities, right? Um, Susan talked about joy. One thing which we do at the Black Health Education Collaborative is really center black joy. Uh, a shameless plug for you, um, Andrea dropped the link to a Black Health Primer, which is really, a course on Black health and anti-Black racism. It's eight modules. And in that, we talk about Black joy for Black learners because we know that when we talk about the impact of racism on our health, it's heavy. And hearing that a lot of the times, and I have colleagues who work in public health units who will call me and say things like, okay, a report was just released with all the numbers. I already know the numbers, but here I am having to be in conversation with my colleagues about this. And it's a lot. So how, as an organization, do you ensure that Black and Brown Indigenous folks are taken care of in this process while that leadership is uh, centered? I could go on and on about examples, but I think it's really like bringing our heart and our, and our heads to the conversation. Anti-racism work is deeply intellectual work and it's also deeply emotional work and we need to be able to value, you know, both. Great, thank you so much, Sumi. Please, Jessica and then Susan, and then I think That'll take us to our time to wrap up. So quick thing is, but Sumi, when you were mentioning internal capacities, it's important for health units to walk the talk. Um, and so really taking a look at the systems and structures that establish, that, that support these oppressive practices, um, and even just within the workplace. So um, I think uh, there, there's a lot of, there's all kinds of tools out there. Uh, there's all kinds of support, um, a lot of, you know, a lot of a lot of information out there to, to support you in that work and, and a lot of colleagues too. So don't be afraid to take that step um, internally and bring it bring it forward. Thank you, Jessica. Susan. And, and I would just uh, add that, um, I mean, uh, Sumi, I think you just spoke so elegantly um, about this whole issue, but I, y yes, there is that, you know, capacity um, building and, and learning. Uh, there's also that, that confidence building to to go out and have the courage to have those conversations and to be vulnerable when you make mistakes and, and then to acknowledge that and to learn from that and not to personalize it like I'm such an awful person I said that is I didn't know that thank you for teaching me that so I think that's all part of it when it comes to organizations and their and their plans and yes people have these great strategic plans a strategic plan without an implementation plan and without implementation measures is not a strategic plan it's a document nobody looks at so i think if you're going to have a strategic plan then you need to resource it and you need to measure it and make sure that you are accomplishing what you set out to do and so I, I don't want to say that strategic plans are important and that nobody ever does them. But if you don't have the, the other pieces to support the strategic plan, then, then it was a wasted exercise. And I'll just very quickly mention that I think a great place for organizations to start is internally looking at policies and procedures that might unintentionally be from a, a colonized or a racist perspective. Things like you know, needing to have blank checks in order to uh, pay vendors or to give honoraria, those kinds of things can can um, be difficult to change and also a really great conversation starter. Thank you, Andrea. So as we wrap up today's webinar, I really want to thank you, Andrea, Jessica, Sume, and Susan for sharing these incredible insights. I can tell from the Q&A pod that um, our participants were really blown away today. Thank you so much. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. 
um, for your participation and your questions. A reminder that the Health Promotion Essentials course will launch mid-May. So tell your colleagues and partners about it. You'll find it on PHO's website. Um, and also uh, a link to an evaluation will be posted in the chat if it hasn't already. And it'll also be emailed to you. And lastly, to access past PHO presentations um, and to view upcoming sessions, please visit the PHO website, head to education and events and click on presentations. So with that, thank you once again and wishing you all a wonderful start to your uh, rest of your day and your week. Thanks everybody. Mm -hmm.